Welcome to a brand new episode of the Jam Pack Report today for January the 14th of 2020. Of course, my name is Samuel Adams, and this is a daily gaming news podcast meant to bring you the hottest gaming news from around the industry five days a week, Monday through Friday, right here on YouTube and podcast services around the world. And of course, we have plenty of news to dive into today. So if you enjoy what I bring to the table, be sure to hit that subscribe button and keep coming back for more on your platform of choice. But without further ado, let's talk about the first big topic of the day, which is that PlayStation is ditching E3 for the second year in a row, not participating at all in E3 2020. The company will instead attend hundreds of consumer events across the globe, and this is coming to us from gamesindustry.biz, which broke the original story. PlayStation will miss E3 for a second year in a row. The firm told GamesIndustry.biz that it does not feel the vision for the event is right for what it has planned for this year. Instead, it will attend hundreds of consumer events to showcase upcoming games for PS4 and PS5. Here is the quote. After thorough evaluation, SIE has decided not to participate in E3 2020, said a Sony Interactive Entertainment spokesperson. We have great respect for the ESA as an organization, but we do not feel the vision of E3 2020 is the right venue for what we are focused on this year. Quote, we will build upon our global event strategy in 2020 by participating in hundreds of consumer events across the globe. Our focus is on making sure fans feel part of the PlayStation family and have access to play their favorite content. We have a fantastic lineup of titles coming to PlayStation 4, and with the upcoming launch of PlayStation 5, we are truly looking forward to a year of celebration with our fans. End quote. PlayStation has used E3 as the place to unveil details of its next consoles since the very beginning, attending the first E3 in 1995 to detail the U.S. launch of the original PlayStation. The company's success at E3 2013 was viewed as a major moment in the build-up to PS4, which resulted in Sony reclaiming its market leadership from Xbox. However, E3 organizer, the ESA, has struggled to satisfy all of its members who have been split over what they want the show to be. Some publishers, such as EA and Sony, want to see E3 become a fan celebration of games, whereas others would rather the event remain an industry-focused affair. The ESA has tried to satisfy both groups by introducing some consumer elements to E3, but with limited success. And of course, there has been an update with a response from the ESA itself, saying, and I quote, E3 is a signature event celebrating the video game industry and showcasing the people, brands, and innovations redefining entertainment loved by billions of people around the world. E3 2020 will be an exciting, high-energy show featuring new experiences, partners, exhibitor spaces, activations, and programming that will entertain new and veteran attendees alike. Exhibitor interest in our new activations is gaining the attention of brands that view E3 as a key opportunity to connect with video game fans worldwide." End quote. Now this is something to behold because the quote itself from the ESA, the statement that was made, does not address in any kind of way, shape, or form the fact that PlayStation again to remind you guys, is not participating for the second year in a row. The industry leader in terms of home consoles will not be at a show that has traditionally been the go-to show, the G20 in a way, of the gaming industry. And this is just continuing to show that E3 is declining year after year into utter irrelevancy, honestly. Now, I don't think that E3 is going to be going away. I think that ultimately it will become what Sony and, of course, EA want it to be, and that is a fan celebration of games. A couple of years back, the show was reopened to the public, where the regular average Joe can go buy a ticket and play the biggest games in the industry that are coming out over the course of the following year, which was a pretty good move, I think. Of course, it did uh, dilute the ability for gaming journalists to really get hands-on time, and it did crowd the show floor. But now, of course, as we talked about on yesterday's show, I've heard E3 has been rather empty, especially last year. Some pretty big industry leaders said there just seemed to be a lack of hype. There just seemed to be a lack of people in general. And I think that is what E3 2020 is going to showcase yet again. And that's very unfortunate because in a way, it's kind of like the end of an era. Because growing up, I used to watch E3 coverage on G4 TV every single summer. I looked forward to the end of the school year, less for summer itself and more for the fact that I could finally sit at home and watch press conferences from industry leaders. That's the kind of kid that I was. And I have a feeling if you're listening to a podcast on this, you're probably in the same kind of boat. And so it's sad to see a decline, but we don't need it anymore. I mean, the fact that we can't have these 
single shows, the fact that we can't have these reveal events uh, that are broadcasted live on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, Mixer, all of these various platforms, you don't even need to go to E3 anymore because the ability to have this digital megaphone that reaches hundreds of thousands of people instantaneously with a simple tweet from an iPhone, that completely makes E3 irrelevant. There is no more need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on reveal events and showcases whenever you can just simply edit a video together and do something like a Nintendo Direct. I wonder how much money Nintendo has saved not putting on giant productions. It's something to think about. And of course, that money that would then be allotted to E3 can then be funded back into the budget and can then be used to go and host hundreds of consumer events across the globe showcasing these games. To be able to get people in playing the games hands-on, the word of mouth is a much more powerful advertising tool than having some kind of big industry show. It has a lot longer legs, in my opinion. But regardless, PlayStation not coming to E3 of 2020, but Xbox will. Phil Spencer confirms Xbox will be at E3 2020 and that 2020 is a milestone year in that journey for Team Xbox. Let's go. Head of Xbox Phil Spencer has confirmed that Xbox will be at E3 2020 following the news that Sony will be sitting out for a second year in a row. Spencer took to Twitter to confirm that the Xbox team is, quote, hard at work on E3 and that they look forward to sharing with all who love to play what's ahead for us. With Sony opting for hundreds of other consumer events across the globe, this year's E3 could be Xbox's chance to prove that the Xbox Series X is the best choice for this holiday season. Xbox will continue building on the Game Awards 2019 reveal of the Series X hardware and announcements of such games as Sinuous Saga Hellblade 2 and Halo Infinite. Spencer, who is already using an Xbox Series X as his primary com console at home, excuse me, will also surely discuss the future of xCloud and its game streaming service that will one day allow players to stream games they own and even Xbox Game Pass games. For more on the Series X, IGN has everything you need to know, but this is a pretty interesting development because I think we all kind of expected it, uh, but to see that Sony will be sitting out Xbox attending. Last year we had the same kind of setup, this year we have a new console line. This year we have holiday launches that are impending, and so this is going to be something to analyze in the coming years as we see the performance of Xbox versus PlayStation. And I've said this before on shows, and I'll always say it, E3, as it stands right now, is currently the one time of year, at least one of the major times of year, that mainstream media coverage is brought to the video games industry. And so with PlayStation sitting out, the majority of that media influence, the majority of that media attention is now going to be going to Xbox because they have new hardware, they have a flashy piece of tech to showcase on shows around the world, and so big name brands, CNN, Fox News, all of the big boys, they're going to be talking at least for a couple of moments about E3, and Xbox will be there while PlayStation will not. At the same time, hundreds of consumer events, at the same time, viral marketing, whatever you want to call it. It's going to be an interesting little thing to track, but regardless, right now we have Xbox going the more traditional route, having a giant showcase at E3 2020, and PlayStation sitting out the show for a second year in a row. Which one will pay off? I suppose we will see in the coming years as a brand new console generation takes over. However, we could know a bit more about PlayStation's next console because a massive leak could have revealed a lot of info. Sony has been slowly building up to its big PlayStation 5 reveal by releasing new info about the PlayStation 5 console every few weeks. For the better part of last year, we learned about the core PlayStation 5 specs without getting actual specifics, and Sony told us about the new capabilities of the future DualShock 5 controller. That name has yet not yet been confirmed. Sony also confirmed and demoed the new SSD tech that is being built for the new console, explaining that the new partial game install support is also there and teased backwards compatibility, as well as to confirm the holiday 2020 launch window and the PlayStation 5 logo shown at CES last week. Despite all of that, Sony never showed off the PlayStation 5 console itself and did not share bare spe excuse me, base specs for the most affordable PS5 version or reveal the price and release date. So, hold on, I want to take a pause right now. Uh, this is coming to us from BGR, so I don't really use them as a source very often. Uh, there has not been any kind of confirmation that there are multiple SKUs of the PlayStation 5. That's not even a conversation that has been had. So I don't know where they're getting that information. I haven't heard that. I haven't seen any other big industry leaders report that. Just putting that out there. So don't think there's going to be a multiple SKU uh, right out of the gate. 
Nah. Uh, however, continuing, we now have a huge leak that may provide answers to all of those questions, and it also suggests that Sony's big PlayStation 5 reveal is coming much sooner than we thought. February 11th is already supposed to be on your calendar if you love all things tech, because that's when Samsung will unveil the Galaxy S20 series and the Galaxy Z Flip foldable clamshell, some two weeks before this year's MWC event, where plenty of other new gadgets will be launched. But if this new leak is accurate, the next PlayStation will be the star of the show in February. Someone posted on 4chan via TechTastic a treasure trove of information about the PlayStation 5. None of this is confirmed for the time being, but there's a good chance this leak is the real deal. According to the leak, the PlayStation 5 launch event will go down on February 5th, 2020 at a PlayStation meeting to be hosted at the Sony Hall in New York City. This is a direct quote. The console design, controller, UI slash home screen, certain features, console specs, talk from third parties slash indie publishers, as well as announcements for PS5 exclusives will be shown. Buzzwords for the console's features include little to no load times, blazing fast downloads, immersive controls, modular installs for games, download whatever, disk drive included, and download the games or stream the games as an option. We're looking at you, Stadia. The leaker says the PS5's new slogan is, it's time to play, and will apply to the brand as a whole. The console will supposedly be released worldwide in October 2020, priced at $499 USD. Only a single PS5 model will be available to launch, and there won't be a pro version out in stores in 2020. Interestingly, the leak says the base PS5 specs will be roughly on par with the most expensive Xbox Series X model, which will cost $100 more than the PlayStation 5. Microsoft will also supposedly have a cheaper new Xbox that will cost $100 less than the PlayStation 5. The leaker says the PS5 will have 10 teraflops of GPU power. I said teraplops. Teraflops of GPU power, while the cheaper 2020 Xbox will get about half that at 4 teraflops. Interestingly, a now disputed PS5 rumor said the console will have a GPU capable of 9.2 teraflops, while the Xbox would go to 12. The 4chan user also said, that PlayStation Now will play a vital role in the PS5's future, as it will let you access games via a subscription fee or just play your own games. Each PS5 purchase will come with a three-month PS Now trial. Remote Play will support PS5 gameplay on smartphones, tablets, laptops, and desktops, and all you need is a Wi-Fi or cellular connection to stream games from the console. The mobile PS5 app will get a makeover, although the virtual assistant we've read so much about was not mentioned in this new report. The leaker also touched on PS5 backward compatibility, compatibility support, excuse me, saying it will be a big feature for the new console. Quote, backwards compatibility with all PS4 games is also a big feature. Through a new transferring feature, users will easily transfer their PS4 games to the PS5 if those games are downloaded. Save data and backups for PS4 games will also be transferable. Backwards compatibility is such a major feature that games from all five PlayStation platforms, PS1, PS2, PSP, PS3 and PS4 will be compatible on PS5. Where's Vita? Come on now. Wow, throwing shade, making it an ultimate PlayStation console, putting an emphasis on past and present gaming. More details about backwards compatibility will be discussed at a later date, especially at E3. We'll get back to that. DualShock 4 controllers, PSVR, and other PS4 accessories will be forwards compatible on the console as well, making it easier for existing PS4 users to transition to the PS5. The leaker saved the best thing about the PS5 for last. The console will apparently be available for pre-order right after the February 5th event in select regions. Again, this is just a rumor, so temper your excitement accordingly. But if it's real, then expect Sony to send out press invitations for the event in the coming days. So this event is happening. We are getting something at the beginning of February because a lot of industry leaders have been flocking to uh, the general United States to prepare for some kind of big show. Of course, we saw the announcement that a PlayStation experience kind of event is going to be held during the month of February, ending on February the 16th, if I remember correctly. So the dates might be off, but I think there is something to be said about some of the stuff being said here. However, let's talk about what undermines this statement right now. Uh, first and foremost, DualShock controllers, PSVR, and other PS4 accessories are going to be forwards compatible. PSVR, yes. DualShock 4 controllers, no. From what I've seen, and what we've seen here on the show, the newest controller has a couple of extra bells and whistles that might make the DualShock 4 completely incompatible. Uh, it depends on how you look at it, but if the back pedals, or the back paddles, excuse me, are going to be built in, as we've seen some new designs showcase, then that could be a problem, depending on the touchpad functionality could be a problem. I don't think that the DualShock 4 is going to be forwards compatible. That's just my opinion. 
but it very well could. However, that's one thing that does make it a little bit iffy. Then, backwards compatibility. PS1 through PS4, potentially. PSP, no way. I highly doubt they're going to make a PSP backwards compatible mainline home gaming console. It just simply wouldn't make sense because although backwards compatibility is very, very cool, handhelds bring something different to the table. And I don't know that the PSP and the PlayStation Vita are going to be the ideal gaming experiences for the PlayStation 5. So that makes me a little bit hesitant over here. Now, on top of that, the quote that says more details about backwards compatibility will be discussed at a later date, especially at E3. We just got the confirmation that Sony and PlayStation will not be at E3. So that kind of makes that a little bit iffy in and of itself. Uh, so I'm going to say this has some instances of truth, but the majority probably false. Uh, now, I do believe that all of the console design controller UI home screen features specs, all of that, that's going to be shown off. That is happening at the beginning of February. I've seen February 5th on this article. I've seen st some talk about February 11th uh, as well as the 16th. So kind of up in the air right now. But the first two weeks of February, you are going to be seeing some very interesting info about the PlayStation 5. Now, as far as these features go, uh, the most interesting one to me here is blazing fast downloads, because as somebody who has had access to fiber internet for the better part of the past five years, the PlayStation 4 continues to trudge along. It is painfully slow downloading and installing games. I mean, it's one of those situations where even as somebody who has fiber connection, I can set it up and go do something else for like 45 minutes before I'm even marginally close to being able to play. The Xbox, slightly better, but the networking hardware within those two devices needs some love, let me tell you right now. Uh, so that's the most interesting thing to me. On top of that, excited to see the immersive controls, uh, modular installs, which we've heard talk about before. Lots to dive into here, but we could talk about it all day. We'll know more in the next couple of weeks. But whenever the console launches, I guarantee you, some streamers are going to be getting into it. And it looks like YouTube could be the place to see it because YouTube has lured three more top streamers away from Twitch. Laserbeam, Musk, and Valkyrie are now streaming exclusively on Google's service. Twitch is once again losing some big name streamers to YouTube. Laserbeam, Musk, and Valkyrie, of course known as Lannan Ecott, Elliot Watkins, and Rachel Hofstetter, probably mispronounced a couple of those, have announced that they'll live stream exclusively on Google's video service. It is not a completely surprising move when the three are already big YouTubers, and it makes particular sense for Valkyrie to join her colleague Courage. Still, it's a big blow at a time when Twitch is already reeling from an exodus of high-profile broadcasters. The trio have a total of 21 million YouTube subscribers. Musk was starting his first YouTube live stream today, January the 13th, with a 12-hour charity marathon to address the Australia bushfire crisis, while Valkyrie kicks off things on January the 14th, today. The terms of the deals were not made public. YouTube's live streaming is still relatively small compared to Twitch. It's growing quickly, though. Also, streamers who have jumped ship from Twitch aren't usually worried about losing viewers, many of whom are likely to follow. On top of that, they just got paid a ton of money, so they don't really need to care. Uh, rather, they're more interested in both money. It's not uncommon for companies to pay for these exclusives. Hold on. Quick pause. If you're a well-established Twitch streamer, some cash is exchanging hands to undermine your security. People aren't just being lured over by the promise of more followers. No. If you are a successful Twitch streamer, you are getting some dinero for giving up that security. Let's make it very clear. And the potential for greater flexibility to grow their brands. What streamers lose in the short term, they might easily gain back by improving their quality of life and increasing their exposure. And so, YouTube Gaming continues to grow. Of course, now it's not officially called YouTube Gaming, but technically it's called YouTube Gaming. You can call it whatever you want. Uh, but three pretty major Twitch streamers. Now, I will say, I haven't watched any of these except for Valkyrie. I've watched her a couple of times, but at the same time, uh, very big news because YouTube is continuing to grow its catalog of live streamers. And I'll be honest with you, as somebody who has gotten into live streaming on YouTube over the course of the past couple of weeks, it is a pretty cool little experience. Of course, shameless promo, I stream on Twitch, or excuse me, I stream on YouTube one day a week over on um, 
Saturdays. But uh, with that being said, uh, it's a pretty robust set of tools, and I think it's getting better and better with each new update. Uh, now, for anybody interested in following YouTube gaming and YouTube live streaming news, you can follow at Fwiz, F-W-I-Z, on Twitter, and he is pretty much the go-to source to hear what's happening uh, in the world of YouTube live streaming and to see the newest advancements, the newest updates, stuff like that. Uh, but... Twitch is certainly beginning to get a little bit skimpy on the amount of big names that they have on the platform. Of course, they have just recently signed Tim the Tapman, Lyric, uh, Admiral Baru, tons of very big names. Twitch is still going to be the leader, but these are some pretty big names. I mean, Courage leaving on top of that, you've got these three. They're getting some pretty big acquisitions going on. And for a lot of these creators, YouTube was home to begin with. Growing up, YouTube used to be the place to go to consume content, and for a lot of us, it still is. Now, Twitch has grown by leaps and bounds. It has become a destination for a lot of people with a very, very cool culture, but at the same time, YouTube still is going to have a place in a lot of people's hearts. And the one point that I want to make here is that whenever somebody goes from Twitch to Mixer, or Twitch to Caffeine TV, whatever you want to say, a smaller platform, Mixer is not yet a destination. Whenever I log onto a computer and I'm looking for entertainment, I right now go to Twitch or I go to YouTube. There's the two that I go to. And so for a lot of people that are watching these creators on Twitch, YouTube isn't as big of a jump to go to as compared to something like Mixer, where you have to get into this new culture. You probably have to make an account. A lot of people already have YouTube accounts. A lot of people have had YouTube accounts. And so it's not a big deal to just log into a different website. However, people are comfortable with YouTube. People are comfortable with Twitch. And that's pretty much where it stands right now. So I would, I don't want to, I don't know where I want to say this. Uh, YouTube is going to have a very big market share in the streaming space by the end of 2020. It's not going to have the 70 plus percent that Twitch has right now, but it's going to grow very much so, uh, well into the double digits by the end of the year. Facebook Gaming also taking off in a pretty big way. They just got disguised toast over there. On top of that, they've made some other pretty big acquisitions. Uh, but Mixer, on the fence about that one. Everybody else, eh, it's chopped liver. Uh, however, one person that's not doing well, or one entity, I should say, is GameStop. Because their woes have intensified as the company has posted dismal holiday sales. Total global sales for the video game retail chain over the nine-week holiday season were $1.8 billion, down more than 25%, 25% from 2018. Video game retail chain GameStop on Monday reported its sales resulted, uh, or excuse me, sales results for the nine-week holiday period ending on January the 4th, coming in a dismal 27.5% below totals for the same period in 2018. The total global sales for that period were $1.8 billion for 2019. Quote, we expected a challenging sales environment for the holiday season as our customers continue to delay purchases ahead of anticipated console launches in late 2020, the GameStop CEO George Sherman said. However, the accelerated decline in new hardware and software sales coming out of Black Friday and throughout the month of December was well below our expectations, reflective of overall industry trends. Overall hardware spending in gaming was down in 2019, indicative of the late life cycle of current gen console offerings ahead of the launch of Sony and Microsoft's next gen systems over a holiday season 2020. Speaking on hardware, excuse me, spending on hardware was down 23% to $1.9 billion year to date in November. Based on the disappointing holiday results, Sherman said the company is adjusting its sales outlook for the fiscal year 2019 and expects earnings to be below guidance with the challenges they faced over the period to continue into 2020. Quote, we believe we have the right long-term action plans in place to optimize profitability and increase new revenue streams in advance of new console introductions for holiday 2020, said the executive. GameStop Corp has experienced a number of woes over the past year, including a round of layoffs in August, which affected more than 120 employees, resulting in approximately, excuse me, representing approximately 14% of the company's total associate base at its headquarters, as well as some other offices, the company told The Hollywood Reporter at the time. And so GameStop continuing to tumble. Uh, the big thing that is going to be the make it or break it for GameStop is this holiday season. 
They have potential because for a lot of people, whenever they see a new console coming out, the first thought is to go to their local gaming shop. And for a lot of people, that happens to be GameStop. So if these consoles do sell well right out of the gate, if they do have a reason to go out and buy something, people could save GameStop by going and buying their consoles. But the big question is, how big of an impact has Amazon had when it comes to people getting video game consoles? Because I've ordered consoles on Amazon, I've ordered consoles on eBay. Both are fantastic options, but some people might not trust shipping. Some people might be hesitant to spend $600, $500, whatever it might be, on a brand new console that is being sent over the internet or, you know, bought online. You know what I'm saying, shipped, that kind of thing. Uh, so they want to go pick it up themselves. For instance, whenever I bought a PS4 on day one, I went, stood outside of a Target for two hours in the freezing cold November weather, and I buckled it into my car, went home, started playing. That's what I did. Went to school late that day. Uh, however, now the times have changed, and so GameStop could come back from this, but at the same time, it's still looking very, very bleak. Again, I want to highlight a 27.5% fall from 2018 totals for the same period. 27.5%. That is a lot. That is a significant chunk. I mean, that is a painful chunk. Uh, and so although $1.8 billion sounds like a lot, considering just how big this giant is uh, in terms of the gaming sales space, that is a lot of cash to be losing uh, very, very quickly. And so will they survive? I suppose we will have to wait and see, but it certainly is not looking good as it stands right now. However, that rounds out today's episode of the Jam Pack Report. If you enjoyed this one, be sure to drop me a like down below. And of course, in the comments section down below, if you are on YouTube, let me know what you think about PlayStation not attending E3 2020. I would love to hear your thoughts on that or any of the other stories we talked about today. But until tomorrow, you guys have a fantastic rest of your day. I'll talk to you soon and peace.